I'm absolutely delighted to see you all here, um, and as well to welcome uh, all those who are receiving this via live stream uh, on the internet. I understand that there are folks viewing this as I speak in Denmark, the United Kingdom, the United States, and of course across Canada. So welcome to all of you as well. Um, and so you know you're uh, in the right place, both bodily and uh, virtually. This indeed is the presentation of the keynote lecture of Professor Isabel Stengers, entitled Cosmopolitics, uh, learning to think with sciences, peoples, and natures. And uh, my, my proof that, that for those of you who are online that this is in fact her talk is I have it printed out here and it is palpably in my hands. I have the, tr the evidence directly here which Isabel has shared with me. Um, my name is uh, Brian Noble. Uh, I'm a, an anthropology professor at Dalhousie University in the Department of uh, Sociology and Social Anthropology and as well a co-manager of the Atlantic node of the Situating Science uh, Knowledge Cluster, also known as SITUSCI. Um, the node is one of uh, seven across Canada and brings together uh, scholars and thinkers and knowledge activists from several universities, among them here in, the, in this region, Dalhousie, the University of King's College, the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design, and St. Mary's University, the latter of which has so graciously provided the venue for tonight's event and with the kind assistance of the Department of Philosophy uh, here at St. Mary's, and we thank them for that. I also want to acknowledge early on um, our other uh, major supporters for this event and the others to take place over the coming week. Uh, the Evolution Studies Group and the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research uh, based at Dalhousie University, the University of King's College and its program in the history of science and technology, um, also known as HOST, uh, the King's Program in Contemporary Studies, and my own Department of Sociology and Social Anthropology. And I also want to thank, uh, in particular, uh, all of my students for assisting with the legwork of getting information out on the streets uh, for this event, and most notably, I want to extend my deepest appreciation to Emily Tector, the project coordinator, uh, the very quiet and demure Emily at the top of the room there, who. Uh, who has uh, uh, not only produced the, the really marvelous poster for this, uh, for this event, but has been an absolute phenom of organizational and communication wizardry, supporting every dimension of the logistics to bring this all together tonight. Um, so thank you, Emily. Um, the Situating Science Knowledge Cluster is also a, a major sponsor of the event. Uh, the cluster draws together all manner of scholars um, uh, committed to the idea and active situating, mobilizing, and reconsideration of the scientific, uh, even other than scientific knowledge practices in our historical and socio-natural moments, and the consequences these knowledge, uh, knowledges and practices might have in affecting the way our world, or worlds, plural, may shift and change, for better or for worse. Within our collective are historians, social scientists, natural scientists, and geneticists, engineers and architects, uh, biomedical researchers, ethicists, legal scholars, museologists, specialists in art and literature, and of course, philosophers. Um, if I missed anybody, I will throw you in too. Um, and our guest tonight, as you may know, is a practitioner of the, the latter of these, uh, that is, a practitioner of the philosophy of science. And that, of course, brings me to the point uh, of the evening. Um, it's my wonderful privilege now to introduce to you our distinguished speaker tonight, Professor Isabel Sten Stengers from the Université Libre de Bruxelles. She's our guest for the coming week here in Halifax, um, who will not only be delivering uh, this evening's address, but has uh, so generously offered as well her time to engage us in a series of conversations about the situated relations of sciences, peoples, and natures, uh, all plural again. Uh, a listing of which you, you may have noted here in the slides projected prior to my remarks. Uh, Isabel Stengers is unquestionably one of the leading thinkers in current science and technology studies. Uh, Professor uh, Stengers holds the professorship in the philosophy of science at the Université Libre de Bruxelles, and in 1993 she received the grand prize uh, for philosophy from the Académie de Française. She has had close intellectual associations with many leading scholars uh, of our times, including Bruno Latour, Donna Haraway, Michel Serre, as well as Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. Uh, trained early on as a chemist, she has worked and published with Belgian physical chemist and Nobel laureate Ilya Prigogine, 
noted for his work on chaos theory, dissipative structures, complex systems, and irreversibility. Her pragmatist orientation has, of late, captured the attention of many anthropologists and sociologists and philosophers, and indeed practitioners in so many fields of science and technology studies. So I won't go into the long list of volumes she has published in French and in English, um, as it would take too long, save to highlight a few of the prominent English texts, uh, most notably her two-volume Cosmopolitics, which is actually available for sale through the King's Bookstore outside this room, um, her Thinking with Whitehead, a free and wild creation of concepts, the invention of modern science, and her recently co-authored and very provocative volume, Capitalist Sorcery, Breaking the Spell. Isabel's talk tonight and the conversations to come uh, fall under the general thematic umbrella uh, to see where it takes us. Now, of course, I, I fib a bit in calling this phrase a thematic, for it's not quite that. Rather, it is an expression of openness, of practical engagement, of possibility, or in the words of Alfred North Whitehead, an adventure to be had in thinking with ideas literally to see where they take us. So this is the adventure uh, and one of deep moment that Isabel invites us to in this talk on cosmopolitics. So with that, I offer the, the stage to Isabel uh, and uh, to see where it takes us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> Well, I, w I first wish to add my warm thanks to all the institutions and people that Brian has al al already uh, <coughs> uh, <coughs> named, and also to Brian himself, because uh, meeting him two years ago, I think, was a great experience, and this is the following of this experience. I'm very happy to be in Halifax, because I think here in Canada is a place where I can learn things I would never have learned elsewhere. Uh, so the title given to this talk foregrounds a rather alluring, a bit mysterious word, cosmopolitics. But another word is absent, because it was feared such a word was liable to create an impression of déjà vu, leading to misunderstanding. The absent word is a name, Gaia. That this name, Gaia, can be felt as a possible liability may well encapsulate a paradox of the present. Whatever the meaning we give to this name, this meaning should rather be associated with or colored by a feeling of jamais vu, never seen. This feeling evoked by what has been called an inconvenient truth, a truth whose radical novelty must be emphasized again and again. One way or another, the time is over when we considered ourselves as the only true actors of our history, freely discussing if the earth is available for our use or should be protected. We know that we have to learn how to compose with what may be a devastating power, intruding in our histories, however we tell them. And we know that what now intrudes is there to stay. The déjà vu then may well tell about the way this knowledge is backgrounded, becoming a wary, yes, I know, urgent crises are mobi mobilizing our attention. But the intrusion of Gaia is not just another crisis to be overcome. She will be part of our future, raising the question, will this future be worth living? The intrusion of Gaia, it may be said, concerns all inhabitants of this world. However, to name for me is a pragmatic operation, the truth of which is in its effect. And the effect of giving the name of an individual being to what we know is a complex, a complex, yes, but purely natural phenomenon, is addressed to those who are so proud of this very knowledge, 
to those who have for so long been proud to have defined nature as a background of their, of their primordially human history. In other words, naming Gaia is an operation addressed to those who can hardly deny their responsibility for the onset of the cl climate di disorder, but who also have created the means to understand and anticipate it. Indeed, what I name Gaia is precisely the being James Lovelock first characterized and who is now scrutinized with all the power of our scientific instrumentation and calculation centers all over the world. Certainly, Lovelock may have been wrong when he proposed that Gaia was like a healthy organism gifted with stability. The complex, nonlinear coupling between processes which compose her and used to sustain what we have so long taken for granted, we are never stable. We know only too well now that the global resultant of these couplings was only metastable, liable to brutal global mutation. But Lovelock, it seems to me, was right to propose that we address this assemblage of processes as an individual being, because the way it answers to perturbations entails a complex and individualized processual coherence, irreducible to a simple sum of modifications. As such, then, Gaia is questioning us who have triggered a possible brutal mutation and now use our mathematical and computer power to anticipate how she will answer. Us who can predict the difference between the catastrophe of a four degree increase in average temperature and the cataclysm, the cataclysm of a six degree increase. Thus, naming this being Gaia is not giving another name to the Earth. Neither is Gaia to be confused with the nourishing land so many people care for, nor with the mother whose primordial rights some demands we recognize and respect. She is not contradicting these other figures, however. She is adding a further one, which is specifically relevant for those who belong to a history which has excluded and derided those other figures. But the name Gaia is also the name of a very ancient divinity, a Greek divinity, much older than the anthropomorphic gods and goddesses of the Greek cities. It may be that she was a figure of the mother, but then not of a nice, loving mother, rather of an awesome one who should not be offended, also of a rather indifferent one, with no particular interest in the fate of her offspring. I would fully endorse the relevance of the ancient Gaia, as it well corresponds to the fact of the intrusion of what I name Gaia. This intrusion is not an act of justice or punishment, because it is not aiming at those who offended her, but puts into question the future of all inhabitants of the Earth, at the exception, probably, of the innumerable population of microorganisms, which, since billions of years, were the effective co-authors of her ongoing existence. Gaia is this figure of the many-figured Earth, which demands neither love nor protection, but the kind of attention to be paid to a prickly, powerful being. I had to begin with Gaia in order to situate my approach, which I would characterize as inseparably constructivist, pragmatist, and speculative. <coughs> the point is thus not to add a touch of mystery to the intricate intercouplings of purely material processes which scientists try to decipher. Gaia has an implacable, unintentional power, blindly answering to the reckless character of what we call progress, is without mystery. Naming her is rather giving a name to the novelty of the event, the eruption of a kind of transcendence, which must be acknowledged by those who equated human emancipation with the den denial of any transcendence. 
Gaia, the one who intrudes, the one whose patience can no longer be taken for granted, is thus not what should unite the peoples of the earth. She is what specifically questions the tales and refrains of modern history. There is only one real mystery at stake here. It is the answer we, meaning those who belong to this history, may be able to create as we face the consequences of what we have provoked. As everybody can accept, ours is a time of confusion, anxiety, and perplexity. The powerful ones in this world would seem to have chosen, but did they even choose? to do as if the future had to manage for itself. The only realistic answer would be to hold our course, struggle for growth and competitivity, and trust in the no green capitalism to deal with Gaia. I will make no long comment here. I will just emphasize that from the capitalist logic perspective, the intrusion of Gaia indeed offers new and interesting possibilities to be dealt with. That is a source of multiple new opportunities to be exploited. But I can only wonder how anybody can really hope that this opportunistic logic may save us from social and ecological disaster. Such a blind hope, however, is quite a quite real temptation as it allows us to go on living and thinking as usual in a situation in which nothing we are able to envisage seems to equal the challenge. Changing course at a planetary level is a daunting perspective in general, but it is specifically so today when what prevails at every level is the imperative of competitivity that is the economic war of each against all others. In other words, we may well be tempted to wait for the time when action will be forced upon us, trusting that we will then find a solution. This wait and see trust in the pedagogical mobili mobilizing effect of some future catastrophe, forcing a general change of orientation seems to me awfully misplaced. I rather fear that when mobilization there will be, it will be demanded that we submit to quite unpalatable consequences of what will suddenly appear as imperious necessities. The oil sand exploitation made necessary, it is said, by the decline of conventional oil production is just a gentle forerunner of what awaits us both ecologically and socially. Also, even if we are dwarfed by the situation, it may be said that each of us here stands as having to imagine how we will answer those who are not here in this room, but exist already, the children born in this century, who will inherit our world when they ask, you knew what you had to know, what did you do? I do not know if any answer will ever satisfy them, but at least we should have some tales to tell, even if those tales tell about defeat. As William James argued, ours is an unfinished world, and action in this world must be divorced from certainty and the demand for guarantees. What we know, of it, however, he emphasized, is that what we do or do not do, the way we consent to the fight or give it up, is part of the making of this future. The Gaia intrusion situates us in a genuine Jameson option. Trust in an uncertified, indeed improbable result may seem foolish, but there is no way avoiding the option because there is no standing place outside of the, the alternative, consenting or refusing the challenge as it is addressed to each of us. The Jamesian option to consent to the fight does not, however, correspond to a general call for action, even if acting may also mean joining in street protests and other kinds of legal or not so legal actions. But this is not something we need to share this evening in the sense of sharing a common concern or a concern that may become 
common. The Jameson option rather demands, I believe, that we consent to feel the challenge as addressed to us, not to people in general. And in this case, us would mean what most people present is in this room have probably in common. Most of us here are paid, probably, to think, imagine, envisage, propose. We have been selected, we have been selected, even fabricated to do so. And there may be people in the world who trust us, we, who trust that we and the students we train are actively concerned by the part we may be able to play in the creation of the future. Are we able to consent to this trust, to accept giving to it the power to affect us when we experience being situated by this trust, we may well feel that the future has already begun. Instead, instead of our children and the children of our children, we may envisage the way we would today answer to those people who trust us. If they ask us, you know, and what are you doing with this knowledge? How is it changing your matters of concern? And here comes the first question upon which I wish to draw your attention. If the question was asked, we might have to recognize that the answer would be that our thinking, imagining, envisaging, proposing is mobilized elsewhere. We, know, we may know well about Gaia, but we have to hope that the future does not demand that we play a part, however small, because we are really too busy satisfying the relentless demands to which we have now to conform in order just to survive. I am not even speaking here of knowledge economy and the imperative to produce knowledge of interest for the competitive war games of the corporate world. As we know, even academic fields where no patents can be produced have now been submitted to the general imperative of benchmark evaluation, have to accept the judgments of an academic market, market ruled by competition. We must admit that we have been asked to surrender a great part of our freedom to dissent. We have now to learn to our students to choose sub subjects leading to fast publication in high-ranking specialized journals about professionally recognized issues, that is, in general, issues which interest nobody but other academic and fast publishing colleagues. One way or another, we have to tell our students that, that if they want to survive, they have to format their questions to translate them into academically acceptable, blindly normative frames. To tell it in a few words, whatever the questions the intrusion of Gaia impose on us, it may well be that research institutions are today quite badly equipped to formulate or even envisage them. And we know that everywhere the same disempowering processes are, are at work. Everywhere a similar cut off from capacity to envisage, that is also to think, feel, imagine, is produced. If there is a fight to be consented to today, it might well be the fight for reclaiming this capacity or even for reclaiming the capacity to envisage the possibility of reclaiming it. However, one never reclaims in general. Reclaiming operations are to be attempted at the very point of the cut, where each practice has been humiliated, separated from its power to make practitioners think and envisage. My trust is in the plurality of reclaiming operations and in the way they may connect, learn from each other and weave relations with each other. This is why I will now speak of the need to reclaim those practices I would call modern, since one way or another they have defined themselves in terms of the conquest of knowledge and the mission to civilize others. Some in this room may not feel concerned 
and, I, and will claim that they no longer endorse this modern conquering and missionary enterprise. But to me, it is not sufficient to disallow ideas that have blessed this enterprise as one of civilization. What may well remain is irony, perplexity, guilt, and a restriction to purely academic, inconsequential postmodern games. If our practices have to play a part in reclaiming the capacity to think with the consequences of the intrusion of Gaia, I will propose that they have not just to give up that they have not just to give up the idea of a purely human history of progress and conquest, which is precisely what this intrusion challenged. They have first of all to reclaim a different positive definition of themselves and of civilization in order to regain, regain relevance and become able to weave different relations with peoples and natures. As you see, I am not equal to even our academic situation as I characterized it, not even addressing the question of reclaiming what we effectively surrendered. I am speaking here as a philosopher and more precisely a European philosopher, still practicing philosophy in a way that has already been mostly destroyed in North America, taking ideas and their adventures seriously. I see what I can propose as a bit derisory, but this is the case of any particular reclaiming operation. But I do not see it as pointless, because ideas have an efficacy of their own to poison or to activate, to close or to open possibilities. Philosophical ideas were certainly active in the modern enterprise of civilizing conquest. They were in particular mobilized in order to turn modern sciences into a general model of objective objectivity, rationality, universality, which as such authorized understanding the way of being and knowing of other peoples as a question of cultural diversity only, as opposed to this model. It may be because I learned to become a philosopher in close contact with physicists that I felt that this model was a lie. Indeed, these physicists were engaged in an av adventure, passionately trying to construct their own questions to answer problems that were their problems, problems of their field's own making, and not at all participating in some consensual advancement of knowledge. This is why my own contribution to the reclaiming operation we need, a contribution which I hope can be connected with other such contributions, stems from a double trust. A trust in the adventure of ideas and here centrally of the idea of <coughs> civilization. And a trust that scientists, or at least scientists committed to their science as a very particular selective and demanding practice may become able to present themselves as such, that is to reclaim their practice against a lie which has been at work since the origin, since Galileo heralded the event which we now identify as the birth of modern science. To put it briefly, we can recognize Galileo as a discoverer of the possibility of what may, be, what may be called an event. For the first time in human history, a phenomenon, the frictionless fall of heavy bodies, had been conferred the power of a reliable witness, authorizing a particular interpretation against other possible ones. But Galileo presented what he had achieved in a way that backgrounds its selective, very demanding, and irreducible to any generality character. He was the one who first enrolled concepts of philosophical origin in order to present his achievement as initiating and illustrating a general method aimed at the production of an at last valid knowledge grounded on observable facts. 
Thus, on the one hand, Galileo was the initiator of a collective adventure uniting colleagues who are passionately thinking in terms of possible experimental achievements, who share the crucial need of verifying that a proposed reliable witness is indeed able to resist their objections and force their agreements. And this not because of their rationality, but because their own future work will depend on such a witness and the new possibilities it opens. On the other hand, Galileo was the first promoter of the general unilateral authority of science, conquering the world, defining what really matters and what are illusory beliefs only, blessing the destruction of innumerable other ways of relating, knowing, feeling, and interpreting. This double game has come to an end today with knowledge economy. Already the power of modernization mobilized the authority of science. Already when it was only a question of modernization, this power of modernization mobilized the authority of science as, at least as much as the possibility opened by experimental achievements. Conquering, destroying, blindly objectifying, never needed reliable knowledge. But we now understand that competitivity is generally indifferent to achievements and rather requires flexibility. In this case, flexible scientists accepting that the knowledge they produce is good enough if it leads to patents and the satisfaction of stakeholders. It may well be that if we had to tell the tale of how scientists were unable to defend the conditions allowing them to exist as such, we would have to tell how they were finally the victims of the lie which made them moderns, claiming general authority, backgrounding the strange specificity specificity of their own practice. For this is a strange practice indeed, I would emphasize, which may be characterized as demanding a very particular enrollment of phenomena. Phenomena are invited to accept the role of what <coughs> I could, what could well be called partners in a very unusual and entangled relation. Indeed, they have not only to answer questions, but also and primordially so, to answer them in a way that verifies the relevance of the question itself. Correlatively, we can only dream of another story if the unifying thread of what we call science had been the demanding specific character of scientific achievement, the commitment to create situations that confer on what scientists address the power to make a crucial difference for what concerns the value of their questions. If relevance, not authority or objectivity, had been the name of the game, it would have meant adventure, not conquest. Given what the experimental achievement both demands and presuppose, nobody then would have thought of it as a model to be extended. How indeed to extend a practice which demands the possibility of disembedding what may be enrolled as a reliable witness and of redefining it in terms of the question it should answer? an operation which presuppose the intrinsic indifference of the prospective witness to the meaning of the question. Instead of a general ideal of objectivity, what would have been produced is a positive radical plurality of signs, each particular scientific practice answering the challenge of relevance associated with its field. As a philosopher, I vitally need such an idea, such a dream, such a story which never happened, in order to make a difference between postmodern critical deconstruction and what I would call an operation of dissolution, what chemists do when they use acid to dissolve an amalgam amalgamated mixture to get chemically active products. I need this story to resist the temptation to deconstruct what has been called reason, objectivity, or the advance of knowledge in order to uncover, for instance, the conquest machine they dissimulate. Indeed, 
such a deconstruction, however legitimate, may justify the conclusion that knowledge economy is only destroying scientist illusions. This makes it impossible to acknowledge the outrage or despair or mounting cynicism of many scientists or to address them as potentially able to participate in any reclaiming operation. Thus, even if factually justified, deconstructions fail from, from the pragmatic speculative point of view, from the point of view of its effect, leaving us with a more desolate, empty world. On the other hand, the solution is not to be confused with struggling against some form of alienation, with freeing innocent, adventurous scientists from power which subjugated them. Scientists, scientists were never innocent. They actively took part, part in the ongoing construction of an asymmetric boundary that would protect their autonomy, resist intruders, while allowing them to freely leave their protected ground in order to participate in the redefinition of our world. But, as Donna Haraway insists, non-innocence is something or practices modern or so-called traditional all share. The question of innocence and non-innocence should be left to judges. What matters is rather the possibility of relevant modes of togetherness between practices, scientific and non-scientific, of relevant modes of thinking together. And here, both critical deconstruction and knowledge economy are a disaster. The first one provoked the science wars. Furious scientists mobilized as the defenders of reason under attack. The second one entailed the production of scientists unable to account for their choices of what matters and what does not, since those choices will be the ones of interest, uh, of the interest they serve. Again, I am following G William James' pragmatism, giving primordial importance to the making of relations, to what he would call the making of a pluriverse, even identifying the relation-making capacity as a synonymous to civilization. This capacity is a testing one. It means a constraint on the way one presents oneself, and indeed thinks of oneself. No presentation should entail a static, naturalized attribute which results in insulting the other whom one addresses. For instance, when a scientist thinks of her practice as objective or rational, she is insulting as she implies that it is a distinctive characteristic that the one she is addressing lacks objectivity or rationality. But civilization, as a testing constraint, also precludes whatever would turn relation-making into the normal outcome of something more general, such, hab such as Habermas' communicative rationality. The making of relation is not the recognition that we are related. It is an achievement which implies the risk of failure, the hesitation between peace and war. From that point of view, the scientists may be taken as an example again. The experimental achievement is a case, a very specific case of relation making between passionate human beings and what verifies the relevance of their questions. Such achievements may be seen as a creation, as a creation of generating bridges between heterogeneous beings as heterogeneous gifted with radically divergent ways of behaving, a bridge which creates for them new possibilities of actions and passions. <coughs> Scientists, as far as what matters for them is this kind of relation-making practice, know very well that it would be de destroyed if the questions to be answered were imposed upon them. Since the second half of the 19th century, they have anticipated this possibility, which knowledge economy has now realized. They have argued that direct control, the subjugation of research to non-scientific interests, would be like killing the goose with the golden eggs. But this image is telling. 
The goose demands to be left alone. She is not accountable for the use of her eggs, that is, for the kind of interest that will turn them into gold. She just demands that her own relation-making practice be respected. Indeed, scientists were never true gooses. Many of them have been and are more than ever passionately engaged in the creation of relation with industrial and state interests. However, in general, these relations are marked by a goose-like quality. The valorization of the eggs prevails over a concern that would have characterized a civilized science, a science which would have been publicly, which would have publicly presented the reliability of its productions as depending on the social fabric of competent colleagues, interest to test and objects, that is also, and first of all, as situated by this social fabric. Civilized scientists would have been the first to affirm that the reliability of their results, as well as the competence of their objecting colleagues, are relative to experimentally purified, well-controlled laboratory experiments, which require ignoring what may be important factors outside the laboratory. They would then have insisted that what they have achieved when it leaves its native environment, that is the network of research laboratories, and intervenes in different social and natural environments, may well be leaving its specific reli reliability behind. The only way to regain reliability would then be to accept the weaving of new relations proper to each new environment, the welcoming of new objections, no longer objections from colleagues, but from those for whom this new environment is a matter of active concern. In other words, we may again imagine a story with civilized scientists, true to the specificity of their practice, insisting that reliability is not a stable attribute, that reliably getting out of the research environment should need a radical redistribution of the expertise, the creation of new demanding relations that give voice to the often messy web of hard questions mattering in each new environment. Against this story, this possibility has a dreamlike quality, just as the one where relevance would have been the unifying thread of what we call science. And again, this dream has for its first interest to dissolve the amalgamated mixture which our own history has produced, <coughs> where the way the scientific eggs are turned into gold entail taking into account some questions raised by their new environment while others are ignored, identified with subjective irrational resistance against progress. We now have to admit the result. Scientists, till the advent of knowledge economy, we may well have protected the reliability of scientific claims, but were active participants in a mode of develop development which we are now shamefully forced to recognize as having been, and still being more than ever, radically unsustainable. The two dreamlike stories I have characterized may serve to situate the reclaiming ambition of what is called today political ecology as an answer to the radical unsustainability which now provokes the intrusion of Gaia. More precisely, these stories I just told are meant to enlighten three features of political ecology, but also a limitation. First, Political ecology needs putting sciences into politics without reducing them to politics. It rather implies fully developing around each issue the primordial political question. Who can talk of what? Be the spokesperson of what? Represent what? Object in the name of what? The invention of the modern experimental demonstration itself can be then understood as a particular answer to this question, an answer specific to the issue of experimental reliability. 
reclaiming it as such against its hijacking by a general model of objective rational knowledge means that a continuation of the political question is needed in each new environment requiring new spokespersons framing new issues. In order to participate to political ecology, and its negotiations as characterized, for instance, by Bruno Latour in his Politics of Nature, the concerned researchers would then be required to present what they know in a civilized mode, a mode that makes this knowledge openly situated by the precise question they are able to answer. They should, that is, render this knowledge politically active, engage in the experimentation of the different it may eventually make in the formulation of an issue and its envisaged solutions. The second feature is obvious. A choice is needed between political ecology and political economy, and more precisely what I call the capitalist logic. I would characterize this logic as intrinsically unable to be civilized, as what matters for it is not a possibility of relation, but opportunities to be exploited. It can be said that this logic, before finally taking direct control of scientific research, has fully exploited the opportunity open not only by scientific productions, but also by scientific claims to general objectivity and rationality. Scientists were then offered the possibility to stand as produ <coughs> producive gooses, the innocent agents of a development they allowed to present as authorized by rationality. They were offered the freedom to ignore unsettling, unsettling issues, to restrict their concerns to the objections by competent colleagues who all share similar values and work in similar environments. The third and correlative feature before I come to the limitation is the need not only to resist knowledge economy, which is obvious, but also the kind of formation scientists receive in modern academic settings, as dominated by the sharp opposition between scientific questions and what should be left to politics or to ethics. Do not mistake me. It does not mean that they should become generalists. But it certainly means instead that they should cultivate an active, concrete awareness of the very special and demanding character of their knowledge and the way its reliability depends on the distribution between what is defined as mattering and what can be ignored. Acquiring and maintaining such a concrete awareness, the condition for the capacity to enter into new relations takes time. And this may be the true challenge here. For scientists educated in modern research institutions, whatever, <coughs> for scientists educated in modern research institutions, whatever demands slowing down the mobilization for the advancement of their knowledge means distraction, diverting them from their only true mission. They have learned equating a loss of time, not only with a waste, but with something next to a sin. We thus need the same kind of deep change that slow food movements propose. Fast science production, plus expressions of goodwill and verbal submission to ethical concerns, will never produce scientists able to be interested in the objections of all concerned parties in an issue in which they are involved. <coughs> will never produce scientists able to respect such objections as they respect their colleagues' objections. But I come now to the limitation and to what I have called cosmopolitics. The term came to me a bit as a surprise. It's not of Kantian origin. When I suddenly realized that political ecology itself had to be civilized. I was working on the formulation of what should be demanded of participants assembled around an issue in order to give to this issue the power to have them thinking together. And I had come to the idea that all participants should accept that the meaning to be taken by what, by what matters for each of them of <coughs> 
by uh, what they are the spokesperson of would be determined by the relations woven through this thinking together. And suddenly I realized that I was formulating, that what I was formulating was the conditions of a political process as my own tradition had defined it, a process that admits no transcendence. The intrusion of Gaia is a danger for all natures and all peoples on this earth, but it may also legitimate the brutal demand that all peoples acknowledge that they are in the same boat, that they all have to accept presenting themselves with what they know, but in a way that renders these knowledges politically active, liable to political reinvention. What I call cosmopolitics is not the solution to this limitation and danger, rather a name for it, calling for the invention of modes of gathering which complicate politics with hesitation. Cosmopolitics is about resisting the temptation of rushing to the conclusion that political ecology is a finally good solution with which all the peoples of the earth should finally agree or else be excluded for fanaticism and irrationality. Politics, even political ecology, has to think of itself in a civilized manner. Cosmopolitics has therefore nothing to do with the program. It has far more to do with the passing fright in a gathering that may be tempted to think that it is sufficient to give to any concerned party a rightful voice. We are ready to hear your objection, your proposals, your contribution to the issue. We are, to the issue we are gathered around. I am a daughter to the world which invented politics and political ecology situates me as belonging to this world. Cosmopolitics still belongs to this particular world, but it is doubling the issue to be politically formulated with the awareness that some formulation may attack the very fabric of other worlds. Cosmopolitics is demanding that the political scene be conceived in such a way that collective thinking proceed in the presence of those who belong to these worlds and risk otherwise being unheard or disqualified as hindering an emergent agreement. The cosmos, as alluded in, in cosmopolitics, thus intervenes as a way of slowing down of resisting the idea of that the correct position has been reached, which should at last be acceptable by everybody. We could say that the cosmos here acts as an operator of mise en égalité, an equalization operator, slowing down political voices mobilized by the agreement to be crafted, imbuing them with the feeling that not every concerned party may have can have or does want to have a political voice. Equalization is thus distinct from political equivalence, demanding that everybody have the same equivalent say about an issue. It rather demands that all concerned parties be present in the mode that makes the decision as concrete, that is as difficult as possible, that precludes any shortcut or simplification, any differentiation a priori be between what, that which counts and that which does not. The cosmos of cosmopolitics must be, therefore be distinguished from any particular cosmos or world, as a particular tradition may conceive of it, or from something that would transcend them all. There is no representative of this cosmos as such, no one talks in its name, and it is not a matter of a special concern. Its mode of existence is rather reflected in an artificial staging to be invented, the efficacy of which would be to expose those who have to decide to the full extent of the consequences of their decision. A first aspect of this artificial staging, I would suggest, is the active distinction between the figure of the expert and that of the diplomat. 
I name experts those who give voice to a position which may accept the constraints of the political procedures, that is, those who are called to contribute to a relevant decision and represent a group that is not threatened, whatever the decision, whatever the way their contribution is taken into account by this decision. The role of the experts will require them to present themselves and to present what they know in a mode that does not preempt the way in which that knowledge will finally be taken into account. By contrast, diplomats are there to provide a voice for those whose practice, mode of existence, world of what is often called identity, may be threatened by a decision. If you decide that, you will destroy us. The diplomat's role is therefore, above all, to force experts to think about the possibility that an envisaged course of action may be an act of war. It is important to emphasize that the distribution of diplomats and experts is not an essentialist one. It is issue-centered, that is, reflects the position of each concerned group in relation to the issue to be discussed. Even scientists may need diplomats because their world also can be destroyed, as it may indeed be as a result of what is called knowledge economy. However, this distribution may be quite insufficient. Diplomats correspond to the possibility of war, and their role entails that those they represent are able, when they return with a proposal, to organize a form of consultation process about this proposal and decide between agreement and war or resistance. The practice of consultation, being able to collectively determine what can be accepted and what will not be, is a demanding one in itself, which again may easily become a factor of discrimination. What about what I would call the weak parties, those who are unable or unwilling to send diplomats? I would suggest calling them victims, as victims need witnesses. If the witnesses role, it is the witnesses role to make them present, not arguing in their names, but conveying what the issue may mean for them. It is their role to denounce any downplaying of the consequences, any anesthesia about the price the voiceless silent ones may have to pay for the political game played over their heads. The presence of the victims is obviously no guarantees of anything, no more than is the diplomatic in intervention. Cosmopolitics has nothing to do with the miracle of decisions that would put everyone into agreement. It rather concerns the demand that decisions be taken in full and vivid awareness of their consequences. No decision is ever innocent. What is important here is the prohibition of ignoring, forgetting, or worse still, or worse still of humiliating. Those who meet have to know that nothing can erase the debt binding their decision to its eventual victims. As Donna Haraway puts it, speaking about animal suffering and being, skill, being killed for our cause, the point should not be to define some of them as having rights, sharing with us the protection of thou shall not kill. It is rather that the legitimacy of the sacrifice of none of them should be taken for granted, for normal. Thou shall not define as killable, she writes. Here it should be said, thou shall not define as dispensable. It is all very well, it may be objected. But is it not mere science fiction or speculative fabulation, unable to help us in what is our most urgent task to face, as I said, the challenge associated with the intrusion of Gaia. As I already remarked, my real concern is about what will happen when urgency is finally recognized. I do not know, nobody knows today, how we will be able to compose with Gaia to answer what is not her challenge, but the challenge of the intrusion we have provoked. And I am part of the generation which will have disappeared when it will be known. But my conviction 
is that we can already taste what may happen then, the kind of dire me measures which, it will be said, must be accepted because they are the only possible ones, even if they may well question the possibility of lives worth living. This conviction situates me as part of the generation which may well be the most hated one in human memory. We knew and just feel, felt guilty. It is what makes me think in terms of resisting and reclaiming, or with the words of Donna Haraway, of regeneration. As I also remarked before, one never reclaims or resists in general. My way to resist and reclaim may well appear as derisory since it deals with ideas, but the power of ideas is never to be downplayed. downplayed. The idea that we belong to a tradition which is doomed to define other peoples as enter entertaining mere beliefs or nature as mere resource is a very efficacious idea which you meet everywhere, which inspires guilt and poisons our capacity to resist, rather leading us to identify with the capitalist logic which has captured us. As for the idea of cosmopolitics, its efficacy, however speculative, is to activate the inverse possibility, to resist and reclaim what this capture has systematically attacked or poisoned. This idea is not transcending the particularity of the so-called modern tradition, rather thinking with this particularity, rather trying to induce the capacity to imagine a possibility that it can be regenerated or civilized, which does not mean universalized. <coughs> rather, on the contrary, it means thinking with its own specific and dangerous, never innocent way of weaving relation, thinking with the resource, imaginative, scientific, and political resources it may be able to activate in order to think with other peoples and natures. We do not know if and how we will be able to compose with Gaia, but we have no other option than to trust that we can make a difference, however small, a difference that is calling for other differences to be made elsewhere. Thus, what I have told you this evening is just a tale, and this tale, as such, can certainly not hope to make a difference, but it calls for other tales, for a weaving of regenerative, slightly transgressive imaginations. Such a weaving might indeed make a difference, as it brings with it a possibility of sharing and cooperating that is a certainly not sufficient, but maybe necessary condition to reclaim a future worth living. I thank you. So uh, the cosmos in cosmopolitics, can you have other kinds of representative of voices other than the political ones? Well, I think that uh, the, not the cos I am not defining the cosmos. I am defining the cosmos as composing this world cosmopolitics. Uh, so it's not about cosmos as such, uh, or worlds as such. Uh, to me, it, it could, I, I did associate it with a fright a passing fright, so it could be a cry. And strangely enough, I began, I think, thinking about the cosmos uh, when reading such a cry, invited science in the modern world, and himself does not give any reference. It's coming from somewhere else, but so it's a cry resounding from people to people, and now I make it reason for you. Uh, it's uh, Cromwell. You see a strange person, I mean, not a very sympathetic one, uh, addressing his Puritan brother and telling, my brethren, by the bowel of Christ, I beseech you, bethink that you may be mistaken. And you see, uh, he makes it presence, the bowel of Christ, but not an argument about Christ, but the presence of Christ, which must make hesitate his, his brother, be think that you may be mistaken. So it's a slowing down, you know, becoming open to, 
to something which cannot have a political constructive voice uh, constructing the common situation. And uh, I would think that this fright, this kind of slowing down uh, is what I, I would associate it with the cosmos. Maybe there may there also may be poetic voices, but it will be it will never be argumentative uh, voices. It will always be slowing down. Maybe I and it's also something which uh, not I learned, but I met uh, in Whitehead. Uh, the only Christian tradition he was sympathetic when was the Quakers. Because if the Quakers quake, as they were told Quakers, they are friends, <laughs> if the quake is not to make silence enough to listen to something which I would say their epoch is demanding. So they quake not to produce a sufficient silence to, 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 to be sensitive to, to what is demanded from them. But there is no voice for the demand just the slowing down to become sensitive to a possibility which has no voice. So is there somewhere in, in, in the world uh, uh, situations which uh, I see uh, as approaching? I would say yes, because when you, are, when you feel a possibility, even if it's only a tale, it's that you have learned it from somewhere. I, it's not because I am a genius that <laughs> or, or a, a crazy girl that uh, I, I tell this story. I'm, I, I believe in relay, taking the relay and putting in my own words something to which uh, I am already indebted. And this kind of coming together uh, with a voiceless possibility being important, I lived I personally lived it in, in some, I was happy enough to participate, uh, palaver with Africans, you know. Uh, this was an art of, uh, I would say, of meeting around an issue about which, what I would call the order of the world, uh, was mute, but had to pass through. So to invent together, and it was an artificial staging, and I felt uh, I and my white <laughs> partners to become better than they would themselves normally be uh, in this artificial staging. And such an artificial staging, I recognized them too in uh, the kind of rituals of neo-pagan witches. And they're the goddesses. Uh, which has no voice as such, uh, is what empowers the imagination and creation uh, of, of those who, con uh, who make the ritual. And so to me, those two examples are examples where uh, it's not transcendent, meaning that there would be a transcendent void we should listen, but it's enabling to open to possibilities uh, which are our own, but which can come uh, into existence only because we don't feel they are our own. Uh, and this is this kind of uh, presence of something which is not a voice, which produces the possibility of novelties, of novel propositions, of of a producive togetherness and not of a, uh, I would say, ne pure negotiation between interests. You know, I, I, again, I have many resources which I put in this uh, a bit humoristic turn. Uh, one of them would be again uh, Whitehead. Uh, he, he wrote at the end of Adventure of Ideas that one of the catastrophe of, uh, of our civilization is that uh, in the Bible, the last book of the Christian Bible is the uh, Apocalypse, how do you say that? Apocalypse, Apocalypse yes. Uh, despotic triumph of... <laughs> <laughs> and he said it would have been so much interesting if the last book had been uh, the discourse of Pericles to the Athenians. Because there, uh, a, 
uh, he weaves relations such that the us Athenians uh, is created, you see? Uh, so, so to him, there was a civilization in, uh, in Athens which could, and also another resource I draw is something which is not known in US uh, or Canada, but it is the ethnopsychiatry of Tobinathan, who is a clinic for migrants in, in Paris. And he once told us, uh, it was after the, uh, the intervention of bi uh, bi a biologist who was playing the paleoanthropologist and who was telling us about our ancestor running in the savannah, you know, <laughs> and all that. And he said, well, maybe your ancestors were running in the savannah, but I know my ancestors. They were living in, the Ca in Cairo. And in Cairo, there is a very complicated, there was a very complicated adjustment between different uh, tradition, uh, religions, and all that. And this was a civilized tradition because uh, we knew how to present ourselves to each other. Uh, not to confuse, not to, to become one, but to have a way of presenting ourselves. And he said that the way uh, when people of different tribes or groups uh, meet, they speak about, they often speak about their ancestors. And this is a very civilized a way of doing because uh, our ancestors are different, but you are not lacking my ancestors. You see? So it's a way of producing a boundary in order to produce an exchange. And in this way, I would say, if I accept civilization as the art of making relations without confusion, art of making a pluri pluriverse, as uh, William James would say, the art of pluriverse making and not a uh, universe, uh, then uh, science is definitely lacking, uh, lacking civil uh, civilizing qualities. So to civilize science would be a good idea. <laughs> this is why I named, uh, the name Gaia refers not to to the whole earth or any other kind of words other peoples use uh, to, name, uh, to name their world, uh, Pachamama or whatever. Uh, Gaia is a name which uh, we deserve in many sense of, of the term deserve, uh, which means that indeed I take it both from Lovelock and Lovelock was a scientist and what he did was, also was addressed to scientists. Uh, even if he was wrong in many sense, he attracted their attention to this nonlinear coupling which makes of the, the, the Earth uh, not a, a, a sum of process, but a coupling of process. And it is this coupling which is so threatening now because we can, the coupling can produce uh, runaway solutions and all that. And Gaia also, this old Greek uh, divinity which was not a loving mother, which was something you should pay attention to. And I'm not so, Gaia is not something ga as, ga uh, what I name Gaia, which is a figure of, a particular figure which is turned to us, towards us, is not something we can reconcile with. You cannot reconcile with the climate. You cannot reconcile with the Gulf Stream. Uh, you could reconcile with, with animals, with many things, but those are not Gaia. We do not deserve to. <laughs> no, I mean. So to compose with Gaia uh, is something else, which means indeed uh, to stop offending her. But it's not a question of reconciliation because Gaia is not an anthropo anthropomorphic figure with which we could reconcile. It is really turned towards us which derided any kind of anthropomorphic animist figure. Well, now we deal with Gaia.
and she's blind and uh, she cannot hear or uh, attempt to reconcile. We have just to learn how to pay attention and compose with it. So it's not a nice lady. <laughs> she's threatening. We took her for granted. We did not pay attention. Now she intrudes. Uh, at the end of your at the end of your address, you spoke about the role for uh, the expert and the role for the diplomat. Um, I think there there remain those who would want to take the role of the resistant fighter or the, those who resist. And I'm curious about how how those who choose that um, would play with play in and in relation to the expert and the, and the diplomat. But it depends. Uh, what I developed was uh, an idea of what we could, we as situated as uh, ex-moderns, the kind of idea we can develop to, to civilize the kind of practice which are, which are ours. So, so uh, resist would mean resist in this world, which is a fiction, fiction world, or resist now. <laughs> the point is that. Uh, I think that uh, <coughs> in, in this fiction, uh, if there is resistance, it is that it is, the issue is, is not well constructed. Uh, but, uh, but it may be interesting to say, uh, to have something to say, no, even to that, we will not enter. But, and it does not mean, again, that cosmopolitics is the good solutions for everybody. It is the one, I, not betraying the fact that I am a philosopher, a daughter to uh, the Western uh, tradition, can invent. To go further, I need the help of others. <laughs> I can go that, f that far mm -hmm. within the bounds and with the resources of my own tradition. And then I, I, I need to learn from others. <laughs> so to me, resistance is too early because uh, I have not tested the limit mm -hmm. of the proposition. And I have to learn the limit from others who are from another tradition. Uh, in fact, one of the first time I uh, used the Gaia image, uh, it was rather uh, some years ago, uh, it was in relation to uh, Michel Serre's natural contrast, contract, and I was asked about it. And I said, well, what I don't like with a contract is that you have to be two to make a contrast. And Gaia is not some, somebody with whom we can produce any kind of contract. She's, she's blind. She does not know us. So we have to take, and this is the, the meaning of the expression, to compose with Gaia. But to compose with is not with Gaia herself composing with us. We have to compose with Gaia as we compose with a, a, a powerful, uh, being, uh, but which is not specially interested in with us. Uh, so we have to, to, to learn the art also of asymmetric relations, to compose with a being which is indifferent to, to our effort. So goodwill has nothing to do with the matter. Paying attention has everything to do. And the need to pay attention is what was destroyed by, I would say, the, the capitalist logic. Uh, no need to pay attention to the consequences of what we are doing. Progress will take care of it. So, so the, and the need to pay attention means the need of multiple collective intelligences and a pluriverse, I mean, the connection of uh, local uh, a collective intelligence, peoples and natures. <laughs> I, I think that it means a new notion of the empirical. 
Uh, so is, is this idea of uh, composing and of paying attention some kind of a return to Bacon and obeying nature in order to, to command nature, but obeying here in the sense of uh, paying attention to, to penetrate our secrets. That's what you said. Well, I think we, we will never go back to Bacon because uh, uh, we have probably to renew empiricism. When I said that uh, when leaving uh, first uh, for, for many uh, Bacon was uh, uh, for many, Bacon was just an incomplete, blind predecessor to modern science. Because modern science were not empiricist but experimental. I mean, the, the event of modern science uh, was produced as empiricist, but the f experimental facts are not just observed facts, they are stage facts in order to demonstrate uh, to give to the phenomena the, the power to put us into agreement. Uh, we do not know, and for instance, when Liebig, at the uh, first half of the century or second half of the century, invented the argument of the goose, you know, which should be protected from all those facts which would be presented to, to the scientists. Uh, so she invented the, the goose uh, producing her eggs in a protected grounds from all the... It was in a book called Lord Bacon. Again, Baconian science. Baconian empirical science. So I would say that uh, modern science as we know it is not empirical. Because the facts it selects are facts to be taken into an economy of proof of or objectivity and not uh, facts with all their strange demands on our imagination. If you look at the methodological sciences like psychology, what, what they recognize are, as facts are very meager spectrum of facts, I mean. Uh, they are not... Uh, William Jane said that a uh, treatise of psychology is just as boring as uh, a description of, uh, I don't remember what, but boring, boring, boring. If you want, <laughs> <laughs> if you want facts, good facts to, to think with, go to a novel. And his brother wrote a beautiful novels about facts where you do not know if a ghost is true, is real, or is just a fiction, you cannot decide. These are true facts. So Baconian science, if it should, was empirical, should be something like uh, what White said, say, uh, never explaining away what demands our attention. So I would say that uh, Baconian science, we do not know what it is, but that empiricism, but all the facts, uh, only facts, but all the facts may be a, a very ambitious program, you see. And this is a program which uh, can be connected with what I, I spoke of as the adventure of relevance. How to deal in a relevant manner with the, ve the very many facts uh, uh, which we are so ready to eliminate in the name of rationality, objectivity, and all that. So, so indeed, I don't know what the Baconian science could have been, how it could have developed, but what I know is that experimental science became the model, and then the facts were only facts uh, which had the power to put every colleague into agreement or to claim to put any rational being into agreement. So it was not Baconian fact, it was fact with power. <laughs> so I don't, and I, I, I think that Bacon was really uh, uh, part of an other epoch which can be renewed, but uh, a transition epoch, not a model. We do not know what it is. You see, to, to take just an example, which comes right from Donna Haraway in 
uh, I think it's in modern witness, in modest witness. She tells that uh, it is said she, she's taking a work of uh, one of her students, I don't remember her name, but uh, in the laboratory of Robert Boyle where the pump, the air pump was experimented and those new kinds of facts produced by the air pump. Uh, ladies were invited and they were shown an experimentation where Boyle was demonstrating that what the air pump uh, <coughs> expelled was something which was necessary for life. And in order to demonstrate it, uh, he put a bird in the pump and the bird died because uh, the lack of, of, of oxygen, we would say now. Uh, and instead of saying, yes, yes, uh, Sir Boy, Lord Boy, you have demonstrated that, we are convinced, the ladies were very shocked by the fate of the bird. Well, and they were, exp I, I mean, no, no, no more lady in the lab because they are interested in aspects of fact which are not interesting. But they are interesting too. So what is it to obey nature? What it is to be empowered? empiricist? Is it to, ta to, to, to uh, define the dying bird as just a mean? And uh, the problem as what we should uh, be interested in? Or is it to, to hesitate with the wall of it? I think that now in our world we cannot, we have to hesitate. We cannot say this is a mean for that. We have done it too long. You see? So I think that maybe when we, we succeed in, in knowing what would be a truly empirical science, maybe we will go back to Bacon. But now is not a good model because we have to learn much about how to take facts seriously in all their di dimensions and connections. <coughs>